Hi everyone, welcome to the fourth video covering chapter six from your computer systems book. In this video, we'll talk about cache memories in more detail. First, let's take another look at the memory hierarchy illustration from our last video. The smaller storage devices are at the top of the pyramid, while the larger storage devices are at the bottom. Notice that the devices at the top are the fastest and highest cost devices, and as we move down the pyramid from the top to the base, the cost and speed of the devices decrease. The top of the pyramid represents the CPU registers themselves, and data is retrieved from wherever it resides further down the pyramid. Now, information needed by the CPU registers is retrieved from level 1 cache if it's there. If not, we continue down the pyramid. Level 1 cache retrieves data from level 2 cache, which retrieves data from level 3 cache. After that, we have to dip into main memory, which is much larger than cache memories, and because of the costs involved, we need to move from static RAM to dynamic RAM to support the increased size in a cost-effective way. After that, we get to local storage devices such as hard disk drives and solid state drives. And finally, if we need data that does not reside on the local device at all, we could go out to remote storage devices like web servers. In this video, we'll be talking specifically about the level 1, level 2, and level 3 cache levels and getting a bit more specific about how they're organized and how they work. Now, we show three levels of cache memory here, but early systems only had CPU registers, main memory, and disk storage. As the gap between CPU register access time and main memory access time grew wider, designers inserted a small cache memory using static RAM called the level 1 or L1 cache between the CPU registers and the main memory. The L1 cache could be accessed almost as fast as the registers, typically about four clock cycles. As the gap continued to get wider, larger L2, referenced in about 10 cycles, and L3, referenced in about 50 cycles, were added. For the rest of this video, we'll consider a simple architecture with an L1 cache between the CPU registers and main memory, but the principle remains the same as additional levels are added. Now we'll review some basic information about the general concept of caches, again from the last video. Remember that a well-written program with good locality has a high chance of referencing the same objects in memory multiple times. That means that we can put the objects most likely to be referenced often into the faster memory at a higher level of the memory hierarchy. In this illustration, we see the main memory partitioned into blocks. We can copy the data in block-sized units to the faster cache memory. The idea is that because of locality, if a program references data in block 10, for example, we know that it is likely to reference block 10 again in the near future, so we'll move block 10 to the cache so it can be accessed more quickly. When a block a program needs is already in the cache and we don't have to move any data from the memory, it's referred to as a hit. When the block is not in the cache and needs to be retrieved from memory, it's called a miss. So first, let's talk about the general organization of a cache. The first thing to understand is that this illustration represents the cache of a system where memory address has m, lowercase m, bits. This means that there are a total of uppercase m equals 2 to the m unique addresses. We tend to refer to a cache in terms of the following measures. We have the cache organized into capital S sets, each of which contains capital E lines. Each line contains the following, a valid bit, which indicates whether the line contains meaningful information, the tag field, which uniquely identifies the block stored in the line, and the bytes actually in the block of data. Now, let's take a moment here to clear up something that can be a bit confusing about this illustration. For capital S, capital E, and capital B, you'll notice that each is equal to 2 to the lowercase letter involved. So capital S is equal to 2 to the lowercase s, capital E is equal to 2 to the lowercase e, capital B is, low, is equal to 2 to the lowercase b. This notation basically means that capital S, capital E, and capital B will always be in powers of 2. Remember that we're dealing with bits here, so we have a base 2 numbering system. So the value of capital E, for example, could be 1, 2, 4, 8, etc., but is never going to be 3 or 5. The number of bits needed to identify a set, a line, or a specific byte in a cache data block will be important, so keep in mind that the lowercase letters above indicate how many bits are needed to uniquely identify each set, line, or byte in question. So, back to our illustration. We know that capital S is the number of sets our cache is divided to, and that capital E tells us the number of lines in each set. 
Each line contains a valid bit, a set of tag bits, and an individual cache block of data, which contains capital B bytes. We refer to the capacity of a cache based on how much actual data it can contain. Because the valid and tag bits in each line are organizational in nature, we calculate capacity by multiplying the number of sets by the number of lines per set times the number of bytes of data per line. This means we ignore the valid and tag bits when talking about the capacity of a cache memory. The next thing to be aware of is that the tag field contains T bits, lowercase T bits. The number is calculated using lowercase m, which is the number of bits in a memory address for the system in question, lowercase b, which is the exponent that gives us our capital B number of bytes, and lowercase s, which is the exponent that gives us our number of sets, or capital S. To get the number of bits in our tag field, we simply add b and s and subtract from m. We'll see some examples of how that works and why it makes sense in the next few slides. So, let's look at how we find a particular word that is requested from the cache. The cache would get the address of a word that it needs to move to the CPU registers. That address is broken into fields. We see that the tag field refers to the tag bits, and it contains lowercase t bits, which we mentioned in the last slide. The set index field is lowercase s bits long and refers to the set that contains the data. And finally, the block offset field contains lowercase b bits and tells us where the word in question starts in the data block. Caches are grouped into classes depending on how many lines each set contains. Remember, this is referred to as capital E. A cache in which each set contains just one line is referred to as a direct mapped cache. So in this example, we'll assume that we have a direct mapped cache in which we have one line per set and that each line contains a data block that is eight bytes long. The address of an integer that we'll need to retrieve will correspond to the address shown here. First, we have lowercase t bits that would, record, that would correspond to the tag of the line in question. We use the set index field here to determine which set we're looking for. In this case, the set offset indicates set one. So now we know which set, and because there's only one line per set, which line to look at. So we check the valid bit to see if it's set. If it is, we compare the tag in the line to the tag in the address, and if they match, we know that we have a hit. So remember that we need the valid bit to be set and the tag bits to match to get a hit. Once we know that we have a hit, we check the block offset. Remember that we're dealing with an eight byte block size here, so we require three bits to uniquely identify each set of bytes in the block, or each of the bytes in the block. That is why the block offset contains three bits. In this case, we are looking for byte four, so that is the byte in the block where our integer starts. Remember that we always assume a 32-bit word size in these examples, so the int that we need will be contained in four bytes, starting at byte four in the data block, which is what our block offset indicated. Now, we had a hit because the valid bit was set and the tag bits matched. If they didn't match, we would have a miss, and that line would have to be evicted and replaced. So, let's take a look at a simple example of an address trace to see how this whole thing works. We assume a 16-byte memory, which gives us 4-bit addresses, because 2 to the 4 is 16. Our tag field in our addresses will be 1-bit. Remember, we calculate that with the equation t equals m minus the quantity b plus s. So lowercase t, our number of tag bits, is going to be equal to 4 minus the quantity 2 plus 1, or 1. We have 2 bytes per block, giving us a block offset of 1 bit, because again, 2 to the 1 is 2. And we'll have 4 sets, giving us 2 set index bits, 2 to the 2 is 4 and we're using a direct map cache, so capital E equals one line per set. Again, each line contains the valid bit, the tag bits, and the actual two byte data block. So we start by looking for the data contained in memory address zero. First, we check to find the set, which is set zero. Then we look at the valid bit and the tag and find that the valid bit isn't set and the tag doesn't match because there's nothing there yet and we have a miss. Now, remember this type of miss is called a cold miss. Refer to our previous video to check the definitions of the various types of misses. So the two byte block in memory that is contained that contains byte zero is loaded into the cache. Now we have bytes zero and one from main memory loaded into set zero of the cache. We've set the valid bit because this is meaningful data. It was loaded because of a request from the CPU. Next, we look for memory byte one. 
it would be in set zero and when we check the valid bit and compare the tags we see that we have a hit then we use the block offset to determine that we want to return the byte at offset one moving to our next line we want byte seven from memory again looking at the set index we see that it should be located in set three the valid bit is unset and so of course the tag doesn't match so we load that data from memory into the cache and set the tag and valid bits accordingly now we look for the data in byte 8 of main memory this will be in set 0 with a tag of 1 now we have a situation in which the valid bit is set but the tag doesn't match so we evict that line and load the data that we were looking for this gives us the situation shown here now that miss was what was referred to as a conflict miss we had room in the cache but both bytes for both bytes 0 and 1 and bytes 8 and 9 from main memory will always map to set 0 so we have to get a conflict miss. Again, refer to video 3 of chapter 6 to look at the types of misses in more detail. Last, we look for byte 0 from main memory and get another conflict miss. The set is set 0, the valid bit is set, but the tag is 1 and not 0, so we evict the old data and load byte 0 and 1 back into the block. Take your time and replay this example on the video if you need to. Understand how hits and misses will happen from an address trace is it's going to be an important thing to understand. So now that we've just talked about direct mapped cache, we'll talk about caches that have more than one line per set. These are referred to as E-way associative caches, where the capital E just stands for the number of lines per set. This example shows a two-way set associative cache, because in this case we have two lines per set, or capital E equals two. Another type of cache organization to be aware of is called fully associative. This just means that we don't have multiple sets. Basically, all the lines in the cache are contained in a single set. Now, things here actually work in much the same way, except that once we determine what set we're looking at, we compare the tag fields from all the lines in that set to determine if we have a hit. If we find a line with the valid bit set and a matching tag, we have a hit and use the block offset to determine where within the block our data is. In this case, we were looking for a short int, so we find the two bytes containing that data starting at byte 4, as our block offset indicated. If we have no match within the set in question, we use whatever replacement policy we're using, and we discussed some of those in the last video, to choose a line in the set to evict and replace. So, let's take a look at another example using an address trace. Our address is broken up a bit differently this time, but we figure out the bits per field in the same way. Again, we'll have four bits per address, but since we only have two sets this time, we only need one bit for our set index. Again, we have two bytes per block, which means we need one bit for our block offset. The number of tag bits we need is again calculated by taking M and subtracting the quantity B plus S, giving us four minus the quantity one plus one, or two tag bits in this case. So let's look at our address trace. First, we want the byte at address zero. That puts us in set zero, in which neither of the valid bits are set, so we have a cold miss and load the block that contains the bytes and addresses zero and one. So we load that block of data, set the valid and tag bit accordingly. Next, we look for address one, which is also in set zero. We see that one of the lines has the valid bit set and the tag bits that match, so we get a hit and retrieve the byte at offset one in that block, as indicated by the block offset. Next, we look for byte seven, which would be in set one. Again, no line that has in that set has valid data, so we have another cold miss and load the appropriate block from memory. Next, we look for byte 8. That will also be in set 0, but unlike with a direct mapped cache, we don't have to evict anything when we get this cold miss. We can load that data into the second line in that set. Finally, we need the data at address 0 again. When we go to set 0 and compare both tags, we find that the block is still in the cache. Again, this is different from our direct mapped example, because with that one, we would have had to keep getting misses and swapping out data in the appropriate set when we alternated between looking for 0, then 8, then 0, then 8, etc. In this case, we can keep both values in the cache at the same time. So, reads, as we've just seen, are fairly straightforward. But programs don't just read data, they can write it too. So, how do we deal with writing data through the levels of memory? Now, if a program writes data to the cache that it already contains, referred to as a write hit, we have two basic options. We can write through, which means that we write the data immediately back through the levels of caches, memories, etc. 
This is simple, but generates a lot of traffic as we were writing through the levels of the memory hierarchy for each time. A write back approach means that we defer writing data back through the hierarchy until the line gets replaced. In this case, we need another bit to indicate whether the data is the same as what's currently in main memory or not. And this bit is called the dirty bit. Now on to write misses. One option is called write allocate. This means that we load the line that's, that we need to write into the cache or update it in the cache. This works well if more writes are to follow. Uh, imagine our sum the elements in the array example from the locality section. We keep writing to the variable sum, so this might be a good approach for dealing with that. We keep updating sum in the cache and write it to main memory when that workspace is done. The other option is called no write allocate. This just means that we don't load anything into the cache and just write the data straight to main memory. Typically, we see the following approaches for write hits and write misses. Either we use a combination of write through for hits and no write allocate for misses, which basically means everything goes straight to main memory, or we use a combination of write back and write allocate, meaning that we use the cache to defer writes to main memory. So let's talk briefly about performance metrics for caches. First, miss rate just means the fraction of memory references not found in the cache. Typically we see three to 10% for L1 caches, and these can be very low, uh, meaning less than 1% for L2 caches. We also want to see what our hit time is. This is the time it takes to deliver a line from the cache to the processor. Keep in mind that the hit time takes into account the time to find out whether the line is in the cache. Usually we see about four clock cycles for L1 and 10 clock cycles for L2. Finally, we think about the miss penalty. This is the additional time, the penalty, that is required because of a miss. Typically, this is in the range of 50 cycles to get data from L3 and up to 200 cycles to go all the way back to main memory. So we could have a huge difference between a hit and a miss, which shows it's why it's so important to design our cache memories and to write our programs very well. If you just have an L1 cache in main memory, the difference between a hit and a miss could be 100 times the time taken to get memory to the CPU. To get an idea of how important this is, look at the difference between 99% hits and 97% hits. If we have a cache hit time of one cycle and a miss penalty of 100 cycles, we could get an average access time of four, cycle, four cycles for 97% hits and two cycles for 99% hits. This means that just that tiny little difference of 2% could mean that our average access time ends up being doubled. The importance and high cost of misses is why we speak in terms of miss rates rather than hit rates. And this does it for video four. Next time we'll talk a little bit about writing cache friendly code that helps us to minimize those misses.